What's up guys, it's the Unhinged Engineer here. I've spent the last six years of my career, including four in undergrad, interviewing and working at some of the top cutting edge aerospace and defense companies, just like the ones you saw in the thumbnail. And I've noticed this really strong through line in how they recruit and specifically how they recruit as compared to more legacy companies. And so I really think that this one concept, it's an intangible thing, it's not a technical thing that you can find in a textbook, really sets good candidates apart from great ones. And the great ones have a dramatically higher chance of getting hired at one of these companies. So if the new aerospace and defense exciting innovative industry is something that you're trying to break into, then this is definitely the video for you. Before I get into that, I'm the Unhinged Engineer. I make professional development content for other engineers like myself. I work in the aerospace industry. I'm also taking CS classes at night. If any of that stuff interests you, then please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. But without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do is lay out the concept I'm talking about today. I'm not gonna string you guys along for the whole video. We'll talk about what that concept is and just kind of define it at a high level. Then I'm gonna give a brief history lesson just about why I believe this has become the case for how these new aerospace and defense companies recruit. So we'll give a little bit of context there and then we'll actually get into how do we demonstrate this concept I'm gonna reveal in a moment. There's a technical side and there's a behavioral interpersonal side. And again, if you can demonstrate that in your resumes and most importantly your interview, I really think it will help you get jobs at these kinds of companies. So let's start with the number one thing, enough beating around the bush. I believe the number one thing that matters for getting a job at these top aerospace and defense companies is ownership. In short, can you take ownership of the work you do? Can you see your work through from beginning to middle to end? Can you see it all the way through that design life cycle? Can you be the expert in your own contribution? So when you write code or you make a CAD model or you make a simulation or whatever the hell else you do, can you be the subject matter expert? on everything you do and speak to those contributions with confidence and with expertise. Can you be responsible for your own or even your work's failures? When something you made breaks, can you fix it? Can you get it to the people who need it in a timely manner and make sure that the team overall is still functioning despite a failure of yourself or of work you previously made? And then overall, can you own the outcomes of your work? So everybody likes to look in the mirror and say, you did your best, that's all you can ask for. And in a lot of ways, that's true. I definitely do that. But at the end of the day, can you own not just the inputs that you provide, but also the outcomes that actually happen, aka can you get shit done? These are the things that these new aerospace companies are looking for in candidates, and a demonstrated ability to take ownership of your own work really, really goes a long way, and it's definitely gone a long way for me. So now let's do a brief history lesson on why I think this is the case. So to contrast the companies that I put in the thumbnail, let's talk about legacy defense contractors. So again, if you're working in the aerospace and defense industry, you probably heard or even worked for one of the big prime aerospace and defense contractor. And when I say kind of old guard versus new guard and how recruiting is different, this is kind of what I'm comparing these new companies against. And for the record, I wanna say here, there is nothing wrong with working at any of these companies. There are fantastic engineers doing amazing work at all of these companies, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to get a job at them. But to be blunt with you, I have never done that. I've never worked at any of these companies and I've never even interviewed, maybe once or twice, at these companies. So I'm much less familiar with their hiring processes. However, I do know there's lots of people interested in companies similar to the ones I've worked at and am working at. And so those are the ones I'm focusing on for this video. The main piece of context I wanna talk about in how these new aerospace companies are different from the old ones you see here is how they make their money. How they make their money trickles down into the culture of these companies and the people who work there. And ultimately that trickles down into how they hire new people to work there. And so we're gonna talk about contracting. I'll make it really quick and painless. So a cost plus contract is effectively the types of contracts that these big primes prefer because it includes not just an upfront payment for a certain amount of allocated work, but you can see highlighted there, an additional payment to allow for risk and incentive sharing. So in other words, if you pay me a certain amount of money to do a job within a certain amount of time, and I tell you it's either gonna take more money or more time, which more time usually also manifests itself as more money because it's more labor, then you can continue to fund me, right? You continue to give me more and more money, and that's where the plus in cost plus comes in. And there's lots of examples of how cost plus contracts contrast to fixed price contracts where you're effectively given an allotment of money and that's all you have to work with. I think the best example that you could probably find out there is SpaceX's Dragon Capsule 
versus Boeing's Starliner capsule. Look that up for yourself. In any case, this is a really strong contrast to new kids on the block, like the ones in the thumbnail. And they're usually fighting for fixed price contracts, some cost plus contracts, but mainly fixed allotments of money to solve a certain problem that is prevalent within the aerospace and defense industry. But before that even, these new companies we talked about, most of them are funded by venture capital, right? So you probably, again, heard of venture capital, but just to highlight a point here, VC firms or funds invest in early stage companies in exchange for equity. They take the risk of financing these startups in the hopes that some of them eventually become successful. Because startups face high uncertainty, VC investments have high rates of failure. So let's contrast the two risk profiles here. In the cost plus scenario, you're signing a contract that effectively guarantees you work and funding for an almost indefinite amount of time. Versus with the VC model, you're solving a problem usually before you even have a contract inked out. So you're building these solutions at risk in the hopes that you can sell it to the government later for as long as they're willing to pay you, as long or as much as they're willing to pay you. So again, to get back to the recruiting point, why are we talking about this? The main difference here is who owns the risk. In the previous example, there's effectively no risk because you're going to get paid for as much time and labor as it takes. But in the second example, you're basically taking all the risk yourself upfront with this VC money. And so who owns the risk? This kind of concept of to break into this very old and sometimes stale industry, we're gonna take the risk all on ourselves and try to provide a kick-ass solution ahead of any of these contracts versus getting the contract up front and then delivering something a decade and a half later. This difference in the risk profile is really why I think ownership is so important to the culture of these companies and ultimately, again, how they recruit. Okay, history lesson over. Let's get back to getting a job at one of these companies. There's two kinds of ownership I wanna discuss here. One is the technical side and the one's the behavioral side. Let's start with the technical side. So I'm gonna outline within the technical section here two like directions in which you can own every aspect of your work because that's effectively what we're talking about. One is kind of this linear, like vertical aspect of, of taking it from beginning to end. So for example, if you work at a big prime and you've worked there for 10 years and all you do is DevOps, just for argument's sake, projects come in, you deploy them, and then once they're deployed, it's handed off to a maintenance team. Or you do prototyping. So you come up with some CAD models, you run some super basic, low fidelity sims, and again, you hand it off to someone working at a higher level of fidelity. If you're working in these kinds of environments, that's not an example of owning something from beginning to end. Versus if you start with a problem, you back solve a prototype, you prototype it, you build a real thing, you test it, you deploy it into the real world, you maintain it as users make use of it. And then once it's over, either you eventually hand it off to someone else or you even deprecate it if no one's gonna use it anymore. That's an example of seeing work through the entire life cycle. And an important note here, it doesn't really matter how big the work is. Even if the work scope is kind of smaller, demonstrating that vertical ownership of taking it through from beginning, middle, and end really, really goes a long way because again, when these companies are making solutions at risk, they have to do that. They don't have these cushy cost plus clauses that allow them to take as long as they want or go on as many tangents as they want. That's an exaggeration, but there's definitely a lot more safety there. Now I wanna talk about the horizontal part. So as this work is happening, again, taking ownership for every aspect of it. So first of all, is it good? Not just spitting out code that someone else is gonna review. Obviously we work in teams and we're all reliant on each other to some extent, but overall, when you're on a project or on a line of effort, do you take ownership of what you're doing and what you produce? Speaking of that, do you deliver it in a timely manner, in a high quality way that's usable for people? And then once you hand it off to people, do you communicate in a meaningful, useful way? Communication in this example is a technical aspect. Do you document your work well? Can you interface between different teams? Stuff like that. And then lastly, again, we'll talk about this more in the behavioral section, but failures of your work. So again, if you get a call at 8 p.m. that your shit broke, do you go fix it? Now, this I'm not gonna open this up to a larger work-life balance debate, 
But this is where a lot of this culture comes from, where at the end of the day, you're responsible for the stuff you do. And you're responsible towards hitting the deadlines that you're given. And so can you mitigate failures reactively? So once they've happened, or ideally proactively. So look out into the future, see where issues are gonna crop up their ugly head and then whack that down before it ever happens. And so one last point here is that you can actually hear in the language of these companies, the ownership model present. There are people who are called the responsible engineer or product owner. I've been called the RE for certain things before. This kind of language really shows that, hey, they care about who owns what and who's taking what into the end zone across the finish line however you want to phrase it so it's really really important that you take ownership of your work both in terms of time and in terms of area okay now let's talk about behavioral ownership so i don't think that this is where the ownership concept i'm talking about came from but the fact that this book by a navy seal came out around the same time that this culture shift and these companies happened. I don't really think it's a coincidence. Infer from that what you will, but it is a great book. And uh, Jocko Willink is a bit of a meme. So if you want to read it, I'd recommend it. In any case, I want to talk about behavioral ownership now. So the big piece here that I have been asked point blank is not just about taking responsibility for your inputs, but also outputs. And this to preface, you could say is not very fair, but I would respond with life is not really fair. And I think that's again, a big part of the culture of these company. So if you do your best and you work your hardest and the stuff that you were supposed to put out still breaks and you still miss deadlines, these places do not care. They don't care. What they care about is that you missed the mark. Okay. Nobody's saying good job sport. And in general, this is kind of the way life works again, but it's especially apparent at some of these companies for better or for worse. And so there's a point in the book that I'm talking about. I'm gonna reference this book a couple times just because it's a good frame here. There's no bad teams, only bad leaders. And similarly, a lot of them would say, there's no bad projects, only bad engineers, <laughs> right? Is this true all the time? No, but something that the book talks about is a good mental model for leaders and the people they're leading. You are responsible, you are accountable for what happens, regardless of how hard you try. Now let's talk about ways we can actually exhibit this in our interactions with others. The first piece referencing the book is decentralized command. At the end of the day, even though we're holding ourselves individually accountable for our failures and the failures of our team even, we are working in a team. And so being able to do that effectively is really, really important towards actually succeeding. This is a huge one, prioritizing and executing. So not sitting around and waiting for your boss or waiting for someone else to tell you what to do. Looking at the series of problems and challenges that you're about to face, prioritizing them accordingly, and then once a decision has been made, execute, 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 and don't look back. This skill versus kind of lollygagging around and sitting around and trying different things and doing trade studies all day and taking two years just to figure out what you should do first, just go do it. The next point here, leaning upwards and downwards. So leadership, this was a huge reframe in this book that I really liked. Leadership is not a top-down thing. People think I'm a leader once I'm given a certain amount of interns or a certain amount of people that I hire and report to me. That is not how leadership works. Leadership is a two-way street. So people at the bottom have to push information up as high as is necessary to make big picture, long-term decisions. And then once those long-term decisions are made at the top, they have to be pushed all the way back down so the people actually working at the implementation, the detail level can again prioritize and execute effectively. And so leading up and down the stack is really, really important. And I have never really had that kind of top down mega leadership role yet. Again, I'm pretty new in my career, but I believe I've demonstrated an ability to kind of lead upward, give people in senior positions who do at the end of the day have more experience, give them the information they need that they may not have because they have eight other people like me reporting to them, give them the information they need in a timely manner, solicit a decision from them, and then again, go out and execute autonomously, own that execution. That process is super, super desirable. Because if you can't do that, if you can't prioritize and execute, and you can't communicate information up and down the leadership chain, and you can't do things that you're told to do in a timely manner and take responsibility for whether or not there's success, if you can't do those things, it's not gonna work. You're not gonna be able to keep up. And so this is why in a behavioral sense, and when you hear about behavioral interviews to these kinds of companies, they're usually a little harsh, and they usually focus on some aspect of the things I talked about here. 
Okay, so in conclusion, top aerospace and defense companies are looking for a demonstrated ability to take ownership of one's work. And this is irrespective of how big the work is. And that's why people with college projects or internships or research or whatever else are beating people with 10 years of experience working on mega, mega programs for positions at these top companies. Because if 10 years of experience person never demonstrate any ability to take ownership of what they were doing, they're just a cog this big in a machine this big, these companies don't care. They're not interested. Because right now, everybody's gotta be a cog this big in these cutting edge innovative places. Technically, this means taking responsibility for your work, both in terms of time, so beginning to end, and time from beginning to end, and across all areas, all aspects of it. Behaviorally, this just means taking accountability for not just what you put in, but what you get out and acknowledging that life isn't fair and we're just trying to get shit done. These are the qualities, the types of ownership that these companies are really, really looking for. I really do believe that this is the number one thing that's super important for getting jobs at these companies. Just as important, if not more so, than technical credentials or technical rigor or stuff like that. There's lots of information out there about whiteboard questions they might ask you. That's not what we talk about on this channel. What I'm talking about on this channel is what's the ethos that you can bring into these interviews, technical or non-technical, to make a really lasting, strong impression. And again, show that you're a good fit for the culture of these companies and ultimately work there. Yeah, this has been super helpful to me, super helpful mental model to me over the last couple of years. And it's gotten me into some really amazing experiences and jobs, including the one I'm doing right now. That's it for me. Thanks a lot for watching. Like I said in the beginning of the video, I'm the Unhinged Engineer. I make professional development content for other engineers like myself. Um, I'm an aerospace engineer by trade. I'm really looking to make some more aerospace focused videos like this one in the coming weeks. And so I really hope you liked it. Thanks a lot for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any other tips for others about getting into some of these S tier companies, drop them in the comments below. Subscribe to the channel, stay tuned, and I'll see you next time.